Friends, our reading this morning is a poem by the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. Keeping Quiet. Now we will count to 12 and we will all keep quiet. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for a second and not move our arms so much. A moment like that would smell sweet, no hurry, no engines, all of us at the same time in need of rest. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would pause and look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with inaction. Life is what I'm talking about. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, then perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Now I'll count to 12 and you keep quiet and I'll go. Like Neruda, <clears throat> I'm feeling some urgency these days around silence. Like I could really use some more of it in my life right now like maybe we all could, like perhaps the world could benefit from us stopping and for once being silent. Neruda imagines silence as a necessary time out, a pause from our quarreling and warring and laboring and suffering, a laying down of our sword and shield a laying down of our burden. He imagines a new beginning born out of the reflective and clarifying power of silence, silence that calls us back to ourselves, silence that calls us back from the brink. This morning we begin a three sermon series called Simple Gifts in which I'm inviting us to contemplate the spiritual gifts that are available to us in abundance during these winter months. And it sure feels like winter these days, doesn't it? If only we would make space for them and let them in. Gifts that cost us nothing, but that contain great power, the power to center us, to ground us, to heal us to help us be at peace and be peacemakers in the world. So over the next several weeks, we'll explore together the gift of, of darkness, the gift of our own breath, and this morning, the gift of silence. Now, I'm not sure I ever appreciated that silence was a gift until I was the parent of a toddler. <laughs> and I wasn't getting any silence. Without a regular opportunity to be quiet and connect with myself, with my soul, I felt lost. I, I felt like I was losing myself, like I didn't know who I was anymore outside of being the parent of this wonderful little creature. And with our home no longer conducive to a regular practice of meditation and prayer, I went looking for a place where I could be silent. 
And I finally stumbled upon a retreat center out not far from our house in Washington that is devoted entirely to silence. Their sole purpose is to help people cultivate silence in their life. Once a month, this retreat center hosts what they call a quiet day in the middle of the week. Just four hours, half a work day, when busy and driven DC Beltway types can get away and spend some time in silence to experience the kind of reset that Neruda was talking about. Some of us spend those precious hours at the, at the retreat center seated quietly around a fireplace. Some take walks outside in the meadow. Some folks read or pray or journal, and some fall sound asleep. Maybe especially the parent or the toddler. <laughs> Regardless, we keep silence together for four hours. And it's a beautiful thing, this companionable silence. Four hours may not sound like a lot, but, but something happens to time when we're silent it kind of stretches out a little bit and, and makes itself comfortable and takes up some more space. In our daily lives, the clock can feel stingy and relentless, but with silence, time feels spacious and generous, full of possibility. At the end of the four hours together, folks have an opportunity to share what they experienced in the silence. The man who'd lost his mother recently found an opportunity to grieve. The survivor of trauma felt safely held in the silence. The defense contractor weighed whether he could in good conscience stay in his job. The person who lamented God's absence in their life felt a presence again, even if they weren't yet ready to call that presence God. And for the first time in months, the, the parent of the toddler felt like, a, felt like a real person again. Silence, healing, clarifying, renewing. What, what gifts does silence bring to your life? And what does it feel like when you don't take enough time for silence and contemplation? What's lost then? There's a story in the Bible about silence that has been speaking to me lately. It's a story about the prophet Elijah. Now, Elijah is probably best known today as the person for whom we put out an extra chair and wine glass at the Passover Seder, hoping that he'll stop by. But the truth is that when he was alive, no one really wanted Elijah around. He was one of those prophets who spoke uncomfortable truth to power and reminded folks how they weren't being faithful to their covenants with God or to one another. And because of that, folks pretty much drove Elijah out of town. That's what we do with our prophets. And it was during this exile when Elijah was feeling lost and alone that a voice came to him and said, Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountaintop, for God is about to pass by. And Elijah dared to hope that though the people had forsaken him, God had not, that God would visit him on that mountaintop. So he went up, and sure enough, before long, a great wind swept across the mountain, so strong that it uprooted trees, and Elijah was sure that it was God but God wasn't in the wind. And after the wind came an earthquake that shook the mountain to its foundations. Surely this must be God, thought Elijah. But God wasn't in the earthquake either. And after the earthquake, a fire, and Elijah must have thought, yes, fire. That's how God communicates with his prophets. After all, he came to Moses, didn't he, in the burning bush? but God wasn't in the fire. 
And after the fire, Elijah stood alone on the ravaged mountaintop, and all was quiet and calm. He heard nothing but the sound of sheer silence. That's a direct quote from the Bible. He heard the sound of sheer silence. Maybe God had forsaken him after all. Then out of the sheer silence, in a still, small voice, God called to him, Elijah, Elijah. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Like Elijah, I sometimes get all caught up in the mayhem and commotion of the world. The earthquake, the wind, the fire, Lord knows there's plenty of that to go around. The front page of the newspaper, the, the social media feed, and I mistakenly believe that that's where I'll find what I'm looking for. But without the silence, we'll never hear the still small voice calling our name that reminds us who we are, why we're here, who and what we, we love and cherish. Doesn't matter if you call that voice the voice of God or the voice of conscience or the beauty and the pain of the world calling to us, we'll only hear it if we listen carefully and quietly. In silence, I discover myself again. Hush. I want to close by sharing with you something that happened to me yesterday here at church. I arrived in Cambridge in the afternoon and came by church to, to just check on things and prepare for this morning. And it just so happened that when I got here, people were arriving in the meeting house for a memorial service. I saw the family gather. I heard the string trio rehearse. Not a family related to the church, but I went about my business and I put some finishing touches on the sermon up in my office. Occasionally I'd hear laughter from down here in the meeting house or singing. And later, when I was getting ready to, to leave the church, the service was over, everyone had left, and, and it was nighttime. The meeting house was dark. But I thought to myself, you know, I'm preaching this sermon tomorrow about silence, and I want to spend some time by myself here in the meeting house, alone in silence. And so I sat down right about where Karen is right now, in the dark, in silence. And I felt this great presence in the room with me. It was as if whatever grief or loss or love that had been shared in that memorial service was still present, hanging in the air, held by the silence of this space. And I was reminded again how sanctuaries like ours, their silences hold so much all the tears that have ever been shed here, all the, the love that's been celebrated, all the hopes and dreams cherished, they're still here, held by the holy silence of this space. The author Pico Ayer once wrote a little essay about chapels or sanctuaries like this one. And he closed that essay by saying, a chapel is where you can hear something beating beneath your own heart. By which I think he means 
that in the silence of a place like this meeting house, we hear not only the call of our own life, the, but the life beneath our life, the foundation, the substrate that upholds and sustains our life and connects us to all other life, life with a capital L. A chapel is where you can hear something beating beneath your own heart. Something that reminds you that you're not alone. But you can only hear it in the silence. May we take a moment now to be silent together. Spirit of life, help us receive the gift of silence. Help us to hear in the sacred silence of this meeting house the beating of our own heart and help us to hear something beating beneath our own heart, something that binds us to one another, to life itself, and to you. Amen.